Stefan Eudis. Perfect. So, yeah, just give him a hand. Thank you. 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 Um, I'm an occasional teacher for Node and CSS. I'm organizing a few meetups in, in Berlin, and I'm mainly into open source, web performance, and web accessibility. And I work for a company called Contentful, and we're basically a headless CMS, which means that we are API first, so when you're looking for an easy way to distribute your content across various devices, you might want to check that out. And we always say that with Contentful, editors get a CMS, and developers don't have to work with one. Um, and the most important fact today that I want to tell you is that I were, when I was younger, I had a passion for music. I, I missed the music talk, by the way. I'm sorry about that. And, and I spent every minute playing. And at some point, I had to check, OK, what should I do with my life, right? So I became a sound engineer. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, and I discovered that even when I had average grades in, in high school, that when I'm really into something, then I can push myself to the next level. And so I became a sound engineer and was mixing TV shows over and over and over again. And then after five years, I lost my passion. And I slowly became unhappy. And the main reason for that was that I haven't had new things to discover. So I looked around, and more or less accidentally, I got a bachelor's degree in media and computer science. And the reasoning was, well, I was always good with computers, so why not make a living out of that? And then it happened. I found another passion, right? Web technology, CSS, JavaScript, and HTML. And these days, web technology is everywhere, right? Node runs on the server. We're building websites. We've got a bot workshop here, right, which is crazy. But surely, web is the strongest run right now. And now that we all agree um, that mobile is the same thing, web te technology becomes more and more important. And JavaScript is powering everything these days. On GitHub last year, there were 1,600,000 open JavaScript pull requests. This is 4,000 JavaScript pull requests a day. On GitHub, there are almost 6 million active users. This compares to the population of Denmark and Singapore. And let me tell you something about these people. Almost 70% of these people are self-taught. This means 4 million people are self-taught. And what does this mean? These people learn out of curiosity. And when I compare myself with all my friends, my friends are playing around with their phones all day, right? But I cannot follow my passion on my phone. And for them, when I'm sitting in front of my computer, it's always, Stefan, man, dude, you're working too much. But what should I do? My hobby is my passion and my job. And I spend a lot of time in front of my computer because I cannot work on my phone. Which brings me to Electron. Electron is a way to build cross-platform desktop apps with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. And the company behind it is GitHub. And 2014, GitHub decided, all right, let's push that. Let's build our dream editor with web technology. And what they needed were a software or technology that made it possible to easily write to disk, to use native functionality, and that a te technology that has a clear separation of concerns. Because there were already um, software approaches to build desktop apps with web technology, but they were lacking this separation of concerns, which we will see in a second. So they came up with Atom. I'm pretty sure everybody is aware of that. And the te technology Atom is built on is called Atom Shell. And Atom Shell is a Node.js programmable Chromium browser. So let's have a look at the architecture of Chromium. So what you see here is that Chromium actually consists of two types of processes. There is the browser or main process, which is responsible for dealing with windows, trays, menus, and system dialogues, and all that stuff. And then there are renderer processes. And these are, are the processes where the actual websites run in. And the renderer processes are sandboxed, which makes sense, right? You don't want that any JavaScript snippet 
anywhere in the web can access your file system. So there is a sandbox around it for security purposes. So when we look at this website here, everything around the actual website um, is managed by the uh, browser process. And the actual website itself runs in the renderer process. So this is the architecture for Chromium. So let's have a look at Atom Shell. Atom Shell exchanged the C++ parts and also enriches the renderer uh, processes um, with Node.js. And the sandbox is gone, which means that from a renderer process, you can now access the file system. So Atom Shell was driving, or is the base for Atom, but GitHub discovered that, well, people didn't get it that Atom Shell is a software that you can use without uh, relating to Atom itself. So marketing kicked in, right? Electron. Just rebranding. When you look into the source code of Electron, you will find Atom Shell all over the places. This happened 2015. So let's have a look what it takes to build an Electron app. And the code I will show you now is the base setup for all the code that follows. So an Electron project um, has to have a valid package JSON. You have to define the developer dependency Electron. When you're looking up um, Electron tutorials or anything, it might be that you find Electron pre-built um, in there. The re reason for that was that initially the package Electron was already taken, but at some point the, the name was freed up again. And then you can have an, a binary which then executes the current working directory. You have to define a main, main file, which will be the entry level for your Electron app. And this is basically it. So let's have a look at the main JS. So this is it. All you have to do is you have to require Electron, right? You have to get in the app module and the browser window module. I'm using a few utils here. And then there is this function that is called create window. And what this function actually does is it spawns a new renderer process. So what you see there is new browser window is called, and then this browser window loads an HTML file. And I'm keeping a reference outside of the function scope to clean it up um, uh, when the window is closed then. And then there's this app module, which fires a ready event, and this is all it takes. With this few lines, we can spawn a new renderer process. So let's have a look at the HTML file. Pretty basic, right? But what you see here already is that we can use node stuff. I'm using process here, which is clearly indicating that we can um, use stuff from a node environment. And I'm also using require. So when we now run this in the terminal, we just created a really fairly simple app. So what we did here, right, we created a new renderer process by calling browser window. But this is not a fun example. Right? So let's have a look at cooler stuff. At my last company, the CTO um, gave the advice to every, new, um, uh, to every person that set up a new environment to install this Mac app Caffeine. Anyone knows, knows that one? It's just a simple app which prevents the screensaver from kicking in. That was horribly important for him. So let's, let's check what it takes to build something like that. So what you see here is, again, a main.js. And I'm requiring several modules. So the app again, which will be used to kick off the app. Then a menu, because I want to have a little icon, which I click on, and there are several options. And um, then a tray to actually put an icon in, in macOS on the top and then Windows in the right bottom corner. And then there's power save blocker. I mean, Electron provides me already something to do that. So I have to define some icons. And I designed a really beautiful pillow here. And I define a, uh, define a menu. So what you see there is just two different states, right? when it's blocking or when it's not blocking. And you see already there, there is a, a, a click handler, which is toggle sleep permissions, which I will use later on. And then you see the same pattern um, that I did with the browser window before, just with a tray icon. So I'm hooking into the ready event. And then I'm calling a new tray. I'm setting in a tooltip and a context menu. And then let's have a quick look at the uh, click handler. So here we use the power save blocker, 
which then returns a new instance of a power saver. And then I'm just keeping track of, of the things. And if it's there, I'm cleaning it up. And if it's not there, I'm creating a new one. And then I'm toggling the menu using set context menu and set image. So when I'm executing now that, I just created a new app. And this is able to hook into my system. And I mean, I'm freaking excited about that. <laughs> so this is 72 lines of code. And I already built the app my CTO wants to have everybody to use. And what you see here is that native functionality is extremely easy to implement. You can get screen information. You can get the home directory. You can use the clipboard, which is still a pain using cross-browser, right? Um, you can set protocol handlers to make your app default um, system um, to make your app a default system, system default. And yeah, I'm really excited about that. Another use case is I'm, using, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts, right? And I'm that kind of person. Watch out for the tabs. When I see my FAF icons, it's a good day. <laughs> so what does it take to get my podcast app, which is a web app, outside of my browser? So the main JS is the same as in the beginning, but what we see here is a different index HTML. So I'm bringing in some styling, so complete height and width for the body HTML, and an element that is called a web view. And then I can call the web view, or I can set the web view element, I put it in a URL. And a web view element in Electron is unlike an iframe. It runs in a separated process. And everything inside of this HTML file has node access. The web view doesn't, right? Because then we would have a security flaw again. So let's run that. Well, I just eliminated one tab, which makes me really happy again, because maybe I see five icons then. But you see target blank on links is not working. So let's quickly fix that. So to fix that, we can just include a preload script. And when we have a look at the preload script, we see here that I'm just attaching a global event listener for click events. I'm doing a really naive regular expression to check if it's a different origin. And then I'm calling this function open external. OK, but you might say, wait a second, Stefan. You said that inside of web views, we don't have node access, which would mean that we couldn't use require, right? The preload script is an exception here. There, because you're controlling it, you still have node access, which is pretty, really nice. So when we now run this, fixed it. I just created my podcast app. Um, so you see here that there is this shell module, which makes it really, really easy to integrate with default desktop behavior. You show, can show items in folders. You can uh, open items with the default functionality. We just saw open external URL. You can move stuff to trash. You can make the system beep. I mean, it's really not that hard. So when we're looking at this web view example, for me, this is an extreme productivity boost, because I can actually use my browser again. And default system functionality is extremely easy to implement. But well, you might say now, yeah, Stefan, I don't want to write an HTML file for every web app, right? And I think so too. And there's this module, which is called Native Fire. So let's have a look what it takes to build a SoundCloud app. I installed it globally. And dun 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 dun. dun. Here we go. I just wrapped SoundCloud. And I now have a proper icon. And I can move that to my application directory. Done. I'm moving all the stuff that is blocking my tabs in my browser into separate applications. This is awesome. And the next thing I want to show you is a tool I built, which is called Forest. Um, you saw my browsing behavior, right? I'm the same person in my terminal. Several tabs, several panels, watchers all over the places, long-running processes, and at some point I'm canceling all, all of them and I'm starting from scratch again. And I mainly use NPM stuff, right? So I built Forest, and here you see Forest. Forest is an NPM script desktop client. 
And what I do is I'm controlling all my NPM scripts using Forest. So you can add projects. These are persisted to disk. And now I'm doing dropping all modules and installing it. And you see a separated terminal running there, which is not a terminal. This is my web app, right? Which has complete node, uh, complete desktop functionality. It works with several windows, as you see there. Cool. Now I already have two um, projects running. Native notifications are running. Dun, 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 dun. It spawns several renderer processes. So you see the help section here. You see an about section. A third one. Oh, no, no, no. Native context menus to make it feel good. And da, 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 last thing I want to show you in a second. So what you can do with Forest is you can um, set it to display on top always. So what I usually have is I have it set, sitting somewhere in the corner, and I always can see it. And I get native notifications. And what I want to show you is the communication between several windows. So when I now remove one project here, it's propagated through all windows. So and the way this works um, is using the IPC um, channel. So what you have to do is you have to require the IPC renderer, and then you have to send an event from the renderer process. In this case, it's delete repo and a repo ID. Then in the browser process, I'm just listening for this event. I'm doing some repo cleaning, saving, whatever. And then I'm sending it back. And then in the renderer process, I can react, right? I just um, did the communication flow between the main and the renderer process. So what is going on here? Message that way, answer that way. For the case of Forest, um, it's a little bit more tricky because you have to propagate the event across several windows, right? So in this case, I'm just keeping track of all the windows. And then what was event sender sent before is the same as window web contents emit. So um, I'm grabbing, I'm keeping a reference to all windows, and I'm then emitting the event across all the windows. So what happens here is one event and distributing all that stuff. This is IPC communication, which is a base for Electron. And when I started this project as a fun project, I thought, well, how hard can it be to build a proper terminal, right? Well, <laughs> uh, and I started really naive. Um, Forest is built using Vue.js. And you see here a view component. It doesn't matter that it's view. What I tried first is I just wanted to spawn child processes in Node. And then I wanted to keep track of them. And then I wanted to hook into the events of standard out and standard error. Pretty normal stuff. But there is no guarantee that these two events or that the events are emitted in order, which says that the error and standard out are mixed up which you only notice when you have really long processes. So I was developing two weeks until I discovered, wait a second, npm install is totally fucked up. So I was stuck for several days. And I was almost um, shutting it down. I was like, yeah, come on. That's just not worth the time. And then there was one project released, which was Hyper. Everybody aware here of Hyper? Hyper is basically a terminal emulator by Zeit, which is completely built on Electron. This is web technology. This is a terminal. So I just head over to their GitHub repository and, and checked it out. I mean, they're doing it somehow, so it should be possible for me. So what you see there is then the solution to the problem. Instead of spawning the command I want, I want, to, I want to use, for example, npm start, what I'm doing now is I'm spawning a default shell, so bash or z shell or whatever have you. And I'm executing commands using standard in. And I'm listening to data using standard out. And the rest is handled by the shell itself. And this works completely fine. It's a little bit tricky, but it works completely fine. And when I digged into Hyper, I also discovered something else. Hyper is using HTERM. HTERM is a JS library that provides a terminal emulator, and it's a Chromium project. So I just have to pump in or put in some strings, and the rest will automatically render it 
will be rendered in an iframe by hterm. And what you see there here, what you see there is when the app creators of an Electron app allow it, you can always command Alt I and debug the stuff, right? And I mean, Hyper itself is just a React Redux app, so you can always open it, uh, check the dev tools. I really love that. And thanks to the community, I actually could succeed with my project, right? Um, so we started late then. Um, we have. Electron right now has over 500 contributors. There are 700 Electron-related packages on NPM. The Slack channel has more than 10,000 contributors, and there's a really active Facebook group. There is an awesome Electron group, right, if you're looking for resources. And there's Electron Userland, which is a really interesting um, GitHub organization. And let me t tell you something. What I showed you so far is the development flow for Electron, right? We just executed the binary on the current working directory. But the whole distribution to chain is built by the community. So what I want to show you is Electron Packager. Again, a thing that comes out of the community. How cool is that when you release the software and the community builds the stuff around it? So you can use Electron Packager, and then you only have to um, use the directory, right? Dun, 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 dun. And you can build uh, for Windows on Mac OS when you have Wine installed. <coughs> dun, 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 dun. So I just made my blocky app, right, the screensaver blocker distribution ready. This is now Windows stuff. Um, but a Windows person doesn't want to move all that stuff in some kind of system folder, right? So there's also Electron Builder, and I started this project, but I don't want to have any credits for that. I started the project with this kind of configuration. You had to have a huge um, config block inside of your package JSON, and then you had even a config file. And what I want to tell you here, what I learned, developer experience matters, and I failed on that. And this person, Vladimir Krivoshev, uh, joined the project, and he fixed all that. So I'm... <laughs> I'm not, resp not responsible for Electron Builder these days, because it should just work. We should just provide good defaults, good error messages. Opinion in software can be a good thing when it helps you to be productive, and at the end, it should be highly configurable. So what it takes for Electron Builder these days is you have to define a name, a version, a description, and an author. You have to define an app ID, two icons, right? Windows, Mac OS, um, Linux works too, and then two scripts. And this is it. So when I run now this configuration um, for my screensaver app, I dun, 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 just created the .app file and a DMG, which is perfect for distribution then. Boom. Just took me a few minutes. So where are we today? You saw already I'm using Hyper, highly customizable React Redux app. Really nice. There is Adam and Visual Studio Code. Everybody is complaining that these were slow in the past, but they're catching up. And these days, they are really good software. For messaging, I'm using Slack. I think we, most of us use Slack. But also, I'm using an, an app that is called Franz, which is a wrapper for WhatsApp and Facebook and all the stuff I use every day. And then one of my most favorite app ever is called WMail. This is my mail client, right? This is just a wrapper around Gmail and Inbox. It supports calendars, Google Drive, and Google Notes. I love that. Remember, I get tabs out of my browser. Then there are crazy people like Brandon Ike building a browser with it, right? I mean, <laughs> what is going on here? So this is Brave. Right? And most of the videos I recorded were recorded using CUP, which is also an Electron app for screen recording. And the Electron folks um, started listing all the apps, and there, is, there are now 283 apps in there. And Electron is slowly eating the desktop market. I mean, it's all the people with passion building stuff for free, and you hack, can hack it, you can dig it. It's, man, I cannot even sleep when I think of that sometimes. <laughs> 
So Laurie Foss of NPM recently said in a talk that web dev is still delightfully fascinating and surprising and interesting and wonderful. And this dude has 20 years of experience. I only have six or seven, and I couldn't agree more. So for me, Electron and the desktop environment was just the missing piece to my happiness, right? And I did a career change because I lost my passion after five years. But now I'm doing the thing I love every single day. And the best thing is I get paid for it. And I think I share the passion with a lot of people here, right? So let me just um, thank you folks and say that I couldn't be happier to be here. And this is it. Yeah, you can check the slides there, and in the slide decks, there are a lot of links um, um, after the thank you slide, so if you want to. And feedback is welcome. Uh, we started a little early, so we got time for one question. Sorry. Testing. We started a little early, so we can I think we got time for one question. Any questions? Um, with the app tray uh, functionality, is that, uh, do you have to configure that for each of the, um, the, the platforms, or is it just one? It works cross-platform. Oh, you, you've got cool. some splits, right, um, where you have different functionalities, where you can then, for example, what I did is I put a menu in there, right, and you could at, uh, attach um, short codes. You have to be a little bit careful there, but Electron guides you the way how to um, deal with Windows and, and Mac OS there. Usually the cross-platform stuff is, um, is documented and you always find a way around it. Two questions. It's the last question. <laughs> um, how stable have you found it in terms of updates, breaking stuff that you've deployed onto people's desktops? Uh, I haven't had any issues. Yeah. All right, thanks guys, that's cool. all we got. Uh, thanks, thanks again, Stefan. Cool. So we got